Hi everyone and welcome to Tap Into Your Creativity. Today is Saturday and I can't wait to have our guest artist. Um, is Princess Simpson Rashid and she is here and I'm gonna bring her in. Um, hopefully she's going to request me. Here we go. So we're just waiting for Princess to join us today. She's an incredible artist. Um, and she, there she is. <laughs> Hi, Princess, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Can good. you hear me? Yeah, you hear perfect, me? Okay, perfect. Great. Great. Yeah, super excited to have you today here with us. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And here's our friend Casey saying hi to us. So hey, Casey. thanks to Casey. Um, yeah. Princess and I um, are here today. So um, Casey was also part of my army of artists and um, she is an incredible talent and she referred me to you. So here we are. So, yeah. yeah. So I've known Princess, Casey for a long time. I know. That is, isn't that crazy how the world yeah. is so small and it's just, it's, it's incredible. So, um, so tell us a little bit about First of all, tell us your name and where you're from and um, where do you work? Uh, my name is Princess Simpson Rashid. I, I, um, I'm from, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and, uh, but I was raised in uh, New Jersey, North Jersey, and a city called Plainfield. And then, uh, but my family is all from the South. So even though I'm a Yankee at heart, my, my bones are Southern. So uh, <laughs> my parents moved back to Georgia and I went with them. And I went to Georgia State uh, University in Atlanta. And then um, then I married a Navy guy and went around the world a little bit and then wound up in Jacksonville about twice. And so this is our, our latest time in Jacksonville. And my studio where I work most of the, mostly um, painting and printmaking is in uh, I'm part of a, a organization called Cork Arts District. And it's down in the Riverside area of of Jacksonville, right, right outside the downtown area. And uh, it's a wonderful enclave of artists. And uh, so I've been here for a few years. I'm very happy to be here. That's awesome. And so um, where were you around the world? Where did you go? Where did you travel? Well, my husband did most of the world traveling. As a <laughs> wife, um, I, I was uh, what you call a dependent. And uh, so I didn't get to go all the cool places he went, but I, we got to live in Puerto Rico for several years. And actually, that's where I studied art. Um, and uh, we lived uh, a lot. We lived in California and um, different parts of Florida. And uh, he got to go to uh, Bahrain and live unattached for a while while, we, while, while the family was in Tampa. And so, so I, I, I traveled with him through uh, osmosis. And uh, but <laughs> he did most of the travel. He's a he was navy a aviator, so um, oh wow, gets a lot. But he flew and landed his helicopters on the ships and stuff. So uh, while well, I kept down the home front with the kids. Wow. So you you went to college for art in Puerto Rico? No. Well, I went to college for art in Puerto Rico. Yes, uh, but I already had graduated with a bachelor's degree in at Georgia State in uh, physics and with a minor in math and. Uh, a research experience in uh, chemistry, physical chemistry. So uh, I, I can't even like what. <laughs> well, I always wanted to be a scientist, and I always wanted to be an artist. And so what I had uh, got concocted in my head around third grade was that I was going to be an architect because that way I could be a scientist and an artist, and you know, kind of mix them together. But and I got accepted to some architecture programs up north, but uh, my family had the hard set of going down south and. And I listened to my my father, so <laughs> I wound up in the, I wound up in Atlanta. With the, I had intention to transfer over to Georgia Tech because I hadn't applied to Tech uh, at the time because I wasn't I didn't think I wasn't thinking in that way. But I, I did apply to Georgia State, and then I got into Georgia State. So I decided to okay, I'll I'll just do the first two years at Georgia State, and then I'll transfer it over to Tech. But I got so enamored with the physics uh, and science because I always. Even at, in in New Jersey, I got to work. My first job was I worked at AT&T Bell Labs, and I got to work under physicists in this lab, uh, doing research and uh, working with uh, optics. And I was always smitten. And I got that job because of a science fair project I did in holography, which failed. But my my the the judge, which which turned out to be my future boss, he was impressed that I knew why it failed, 
and I was able to just talk about it. <laughs> so already I had the, the gift of talking my way out of problems. And so and it got me a job. And my first job, I was 16, and I worked at uh, Bell Labs. So I was, uh, I was touched by the whole science thing, and I, was con and I was very encouraged. I had a lot of mentors at that time. And uh, New Jersey is a great state and very um, proactive in uh, encouraging their, their, their high school and middle school. So I was very fortunate, I felt, that I was educated up in North for a while. Um, and then when we moved to Atlanta, I was still attached to science. I really, I really wanted to do that. And then I remember while I was in chemistry class at Georgia State, I remember uh, how I was struck by how connected science and art is. You know, I never forgot my art part. I was always drawing and writing and painting on the side. So take but not us seriously. back to your childhood before you even like started thinking about physics and math or were you always thinking when you were a little girl like were you always good at, at, at in science and and how did that come about well actually it's weird because uh i was never i was always good in science but i wasn't always good in math like if you if you knew me in high school you were like physics really because because i was very bad at math actually i remember third fourth grade you know uh my my father was like well i don't think she's ever going to get it he was trying to teach me fractions and uh what i found out later is the people sometimes the people who are teaching you don't know it and so you can't get it because they don't know it really well to explain it and uh you think you're dumb but it's not really all you <laughs> so sometimes it's the way the teacher approaches the, the subject matter with you because everyone's a different type of learner and i think i was definitely a visual learner and um so anyway I, I realized, though, I wanted to, I love science, and a lot of the science that I loved was math-based science. So I figured, okay, well, this is a weakness, you know, that you, that was hurting your strength, which is science. You know, I used to, in the summer, after, in the summer, I would go, and I had a little, my mom had set me up a little closet, which I turned into a lab around junior high and oh uh God. i i would um half the half the half it was mine and half was my sister's and so my side was science and it had uh uh dissected organisms from uh from class like i oh ate formaldehyde and i had a microscope and uh, stuff like that and my sister had an easy bake oven on her side so she was doing the traditional bacon stuff but uh i would go and i would get bugs and i would tear them you know i would dissect them and then i would uh, draw in my <laughs> in my journal of what I saw in the microscope. And that did that from an early age up into junior high. And then, you know, uh, it was, uh, I was always intrigued with, with that. And, I, and it was even then drawing, because I had gotten this book about science experiments at home and you, you drawing, uh, you, it said, draw your, what you see, what you observe. And I think that was like a first connection with, okay, you know, this is very, this art and science connect because that's how you can understand and process right. what you're seeing. And so that was like the first inkling that science and art was the connection. And then I remember in college taking calculus and uh, classes because you have a built-in minor when you're a physics major. Uh, but I remember, especially around the second calculus class where you're dealing with integration and really ab start starting abstractions of mathematics where you're using letters instead of numbers and stuff like that and little symbols. Uh, it, 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 I, I was struck by that. This is like music. This is like um, this is a language, a secret language, and it's artistic. And if you you get to pick how you get to know about five different ways to solve the problem, but you get to pick the most elegant way, because you you know you have to pick the most elegant way that's fast and efficient. And I just I was like, that's, God, that's I wish art. you would have been my math teacher. I, I know mean, you're right? so yes, <laughs> you're so passionate, and the way you're describing it. It makes me want to just jump into it because yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. I just never learned it that way. And I think I didn't either. <laughs> I had to teach myself. But then every now and then I got uh, a teacher who like this, this particular teacher where I had this epiphany. She actually on the side, she was she was uh, she she was a volunteer violinist at the orchestra in the orchestra in Atlanta. And this is what she did on the side. Like she was a math teacher, math professor at the university. That was her job. But to to stimulate her life, her creative life, she she right. protected that, and she made. She really she, used she both sides music. of her brain, didn't she? Yes, and uh, she didn't talk about it a lot, but she let it slip every now and then. And I was like, ah, oh. right. So I way she taught, I think, is why I felt there was a music 
connection and uh, especially when you're talking about abstraction with jazz and classical music that type of thing and she didn't like I she just like I said she didn't talk about it a lot because not everybody would have been interested but she dropped some seeds and I never forgot her like I never forgot this lady Miss Fratelli and and uh I was always uh struck by that and so that made me more curious as I got more mature and I started exploring abstract jazz because I started out as a musician and a dancer when I was before before high school and stuff, I was uh, I played in the played clarinet and I I did ballet for uh, nine years. I was on point for about uh, oh four gosh. years. How are so, your feet today? Huh? How are your feet today? Actually, I'm terrible. I'm wearing <laughs> I'm wearing support heels right now. It's funny you say that because I was like, oh my god, I don't have an arch anymore. But. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's another story. But uh, yeah, I think all of that connected with me. And again, like I say, New Jersey, especially at the time I was there, which was like in the 80s and 90s, uh, was very, the, my, my area, North Jersey, was very uh, art centric. You know, there was a lot of arts going on, a lot of stuff for kids to do. It's so nice, of, too, that you had your parents that really cultivated that in, especially my in mother. you guys. Especially my mother. My father, he was a solid support, he, he financial support. But my mother was the one who really, you know, put us in, ex exposed us to, to things like that. And also made us sure that we were really well read. Spent, we spent all, uh, you know, a lot of free time in the library. And uh, again, my city, Plainfield, had an excellent, it still does, has an excellent uh, library. It was very accessible for you to grow into, you know, from, there was an area for children and then an area for adults. And it was a uh, it, it had a lot and uh so anyway i think all of that is exposed me and made me who i became you know later so. so now fast forward you meet your husband now you're traveling the world and you end up in puerto rico and then right. you're like okay this is my chance to like go into art is that well what happened well, it was funny. I, like I said, I had always these seeds, but then I got I really got focused on science and um but then I got married. <laughs> so, <laughs> so so and I, and it was, I married someone in the military, going into the military. So we he was actually in the same program I was in. He was a McNair scholar at Georgia State. He was a physics major at Georgia State, but his he was more physics and astronomy and I was physics, physics, chemistry, math. Right. He had he was math, too, but most he went towards the astronomy. But we worked. We had a lot of uh, student teaching jobs together and we worked for several of the scientists as research assistants and stuff. And, um, you know, and I, I he was the only other brown guy in the department. And so, so I was bound to, to know him. Like, I remember. You know, when I was trying to make the decision whether to major in physics, that uh, all my advisors, Dr. Hankla and uh, a few other advisors, were saying, "You need to talk to Tariq Rashid because he would, he will, uh, he help you make decision." And I, and there was a, my school, George State at the time was very international. That's one of the reasons why I liked the school. It was a very international school. Had a lot of students from India, China, every, a large body of international students, even though it was in the heart of downtown Atlanta. And so everyone keep telling me to meet this guy, Tariq Rashid, and, and ask him what I should, whether or not I should major in physics or chemistry. Or where where was he from? Well, I thought he was an Indian guy. And I was like, why does everyone keep telling me to meet this Indian guy, right? Because <laughs> I had a lot of Indian friends at the time, Muslim friends, whatever. So I was like, why do you keep wanting me to meet this guy? But I went to a science fiction club meeting a, a couple you know, months after that, and I hadn't met him yet. And I, I walked into the sci-fi meeting, and then in comes this, this guy. And all the other kids were not black or brown or nothing. It was always traditional white kids, you know, a, a few Asian kids, but they were no Tariq Rashid's. And this in comes Tariq Rashid. And he said, yeah, my name is Tariq Rashid. And he, you know, he's very, in, they knew him already because he's a big sci-fi guy. And uh, he's a little bra black kid from Atlanta. <laughs> so I was like, you're Tariq Rashid? <laughs> Oh, it was meant to be for yeah, sure. Yeah, so we hit it off, and uh, yeah, I, I knew I knew that day. That is he, he was, still in the service now? No, he retired twenty. Uh, well, he re we retired. Uh, I think about four years ago, maybe. And uh, oh so my he God. did twenty. Thank him for all his service. That's yes. a long time he was there. Twenty wow. years, yeah, definitely. And uh, a lot. Some of that time we had an attack, so it was really hard on the family. And uh, but uh, he he he's a. Uh, Gung ho. I mean, he's a patriot and everything. So, and he loved to fly. I mean, that's that was a big thing for him. And so he went into the Navy, and then he graduated, and then I graduated a year afterwards. And that issue was I kind of 
stopped because I got all this indoctrination about what he needed as a Navy officer because he was going in as an officer. And uh, I kind of, and I will honest, honestly say that the job market coming out of college at that time was very bleak. You know, it was uh, 95 and uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunities going on. I could, websites weren't very useful as, nope. like they are now. <laughs> yes. And so I, and I didn't really have a lot of, when, when I said I was getting married, all my advisors kind of like stopped advising me. They kind of <laughs> like, like it, I almost felt like. And not only marrying, but marrying into the Navy, which is. Yeah. But I, I think I think mostly for them it was married getting married was it was, it was well and I guess also that he was uh, he was going into the navy because it was like they stopped advising me like and so I didn't really get as much help like what to do next and so left to myself you know the the the, mar the wedding and all that so we and I wanted to graduate so I finished up all my requirements and then when we when I graduated he came and picked me up and got me we moved to we milled, we moved to Milton Florida. <laughs> Wow, that's a yeah. change. Yeah, it's a big change. And and then, you know, and I, I was kind of, I guess, I, I think I was a little lost. So anyway, fast forward, um, I was thinking, I was just kind of figuring out what I wanted to do next and everything. And he was, he was gung, he was focused. He had flight school and whatever. And then we're getting new, new, going to different places like Virginia. And then we went to Puerto Rico. And uh, so I got caught up with all that and then becoming a Navy officer's wife because there's responsibilities to that. And so when we moved to Puerto Rico, um, I was all in. And then it was a lot, you know, and uh, he was a young, all, a newly commissioned officer. And uh, it was awesome being in Puerto Rico, for sure. But then my best friend from New Jersey, my best friend from high school, came and visited us. And he stayed with us. And he, he was after he, but right before he left, he, he said to me, he said, you know, what's happened to you? Where is my best friend? I said, what are you talking about? I said, you've been an artist all your life, and I don't see you doing any art, or you just, you just, a, you just, this almost a stepper wife. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so he pushed you. So he gave me a good kick in the pants. And I had been painting, but I hadn't been sharing it. And, uh, and he said, you know, get, you need to find, you need to get back to you. You know, this is all nice and everything. And I like this guy. He's wonderful for you, but you need, you, I, you're losing my, where's my girl at, right? You know, and so uh, anyway, we got there. And uh, right after I dropped him off at the airport, I went to the art school in San Juan and enrolled. Well, I showed him my portfolio and applied and all that kind of stuff, but I got accepted and, and I wrote, I wasn't as interested in, um, I wasn't interested in getting another degree because it only had an undergraduate degree, but I wanted all the studio courses. I wanted print right. making, I wanted sculpture, I wanted photography, I wanted painting. And I did, I got fully immersed. It was a wonderful experience and uh, I got lots of skills. So then we moved to Jacksonville for the first time and that's really when I started really focusing on my art career. And um, were you always interested in, it sounds like you were always interested in abstract uh, non-objective art because of what you were saying about math and rhythm and music and did you start that way or did you start realistic no. and then start I started, to change? I started very realistic. Uh, portraits, uh, self-portraits, paintings, but especially around the time we moved to Jacksonville was I just become a new mother and for the, and, uh, and I had been like really struggling with like how do I become a good mother and a good artist at the same time because it was all, both new. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was reading a lot of books on both, you know. And um, so anyway, I kind of really into and, and because of my physics background, uh, my science background, I'm a little masochistic. You know, I like to do things, hard things. You know, there's I, I find satisfaction out of doing hard things. So anyway. And I'm sure you're a perfectionist, I, too. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I well, I, I do try to get it, get it right. I kind of try to get it right, and uh, I'm not, but I'm also learning how to do it good enough to keep so I keep moving, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, exactly, uh, exactly. But, yeah, exactly. But so, because it's all, it's hard to do that, you know, when right. when you know that two and two are four, right? Right. In paint, that doesn't apply whatsoever. Yeah. So I think the the for me the the thing was I felt. And, it, and, and I don't think it was right for me to feel this way, but I felt that for me to be able to be free to, 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 to be abstract, I needed to force myself to do realism. So I got really big into landscape painting, uh, plein air painting, and also doing some portraits, portraiture and still lifes and stuff like that. And then I really, I still do plein air painting. I'm a member of a plein air society here and I was in California. And I think, you know, stuff like that, painting in the wild, painting what you see is refreshing, but it also keeps you honest, you know? 
And so I find that that's, that work for me is very, uh, I do that on a regular basis and I, and I keep a sketchbook and I draw what I see and I try to, uh, to, to be accurate. But I'm, I was always interested in the essence of what I see. So very soon, left to myself, those drawings become abstractions, right? But I try to start with the, the drawing as it is and then I, I may work it again and again in a different way to uh, abstract it because I want the essence of it. Because even what we see, what we think we see is not really what we see. We're seeing an approximation that right. our mind, based on our filters and all that kind of stuff. Can you see? Oops. I'm oh, sorry. there we go. Uh, yeah. the, 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 where our brain processes it. And so uh, everything is an abstraction. So that's where I, as I'm, I've matured to accept that I'm an abstract artist and it's okay. And I think all the world is abstract and really, uh, now I feel it's my mission to to uh, use abstraction to get people to see the world differently. So how has Corona affected you? Where do you paint? Do you have to travel for your studio? Do you paint at home? Um, how are these months have been for you? Uh, when the beginning of Corolla, Corona, uh, it was very dark because, uh, you know, we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know if this was the apocalypse. I mean, we, <laughs> I never lived through a pandemic before. So uh, so it was very bleak. So I packed up the studio. I went to them and went to my house. And up until this is the first time living this time in Jacksonville, this is the first house I've ever had that, uh, that didn't really have a space for me. Everybody else in my house have a space, but I didn't, right? And uh, I can and relate I okay. on that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was okay with it because I have I have my studio at court. So I was like, okay, I can I don't I'm not gonna make a big deal about this because you know my I have two kids and they both have their own spaces and uh, my husband has his own space. He's working at, remotely, so he needed some space where he's comfortable and stuff. So everyone can spread out, but me, I just leave. <laughs> which is also fine <laughs> because I like, I need time alone because, you know, as a mother, you're always, everyone's always pulling at you. So you need, you should need your time uh, by yourself to create. Right. right. So I, I didn't have a big deal, but with Corona, it forced me to have to come home. Right. And cause we closed uh, our, our, our people here closed down the studios or limited access to the studio as far as, you know, for safety reasons, especially in the early days, cause we didn't know what was happening. And so uh, a lot of us went, went, went home. And so I, I couldn't find a place to work normally because I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm messy and I, everything's everywhere. And so I try not to infringe upon all the other people in the house. So I, 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 I wind up in the patio <laughs> with the sun <laughs> screened in sunroom, and which is fine. Like I was saying the other day, it's fine uh, until it rains. And then I get it gets it gets drenched in there the the humidity and then it gets really wet and it's, then it's not fine. So I'm moving my stuff in and out and everything. And like again, the early days I made do and I, I was just grateful that I could still work. And it was actually kind of cool in a way because on the sunny days, I mean, I could work in my pajamas. I could you know I get a cup of coffee. I did. I, I don't eat in my studio so much here at Cork because I don't want any pestilence. But at home, you know, I can eat, I can go to the kitchen, I can, you know, it was a lot more comfortable, you know, in a way, again, when it was sunny. But so uh, creatively, uh, you were still able to. I was still able things. to work, yeah. yeah. And then actually, what because of the because of Corona, and I was home, I wasn't working big as much. I, but I was working small, and I had a bunch of small pieces that I had been, I just hadn't got to, and I had been, they've been sitting around for almost a year. And I said, you know, um, and, and really nothing was happening. Nobody was calling, nobody, no commitment. So I said, let me just start fooling around with these just so that I won't get too depressed. And it was fun. And so uh, then I wound up doing a whole bunch of little five by fives and uh, six by six uh, paintings. And so that was great. And then things started to happen like a, a month or two after that was going. And I made a couple of videos of those. And so I was really into those and then I got bored with them and then I did some more little ones in a whole different vein that I had uh, picked up. So it, the, being home and being in that constrained type of uh, limitation made me work on things that I had put away for a week, mm -hmm. almost a year or so and uh, made me pick them back up, which was good because working on those prepared me for what I'm doing right now. So, so why don't you show us 
around and then you can tell us what you are preparing to do and talk about the mural that you just finished um so <laughs> let's just finish let's, well <laughs> almost finished almost finished almost yeah. finished but um yeah why don't you take your phone right now and flip the camera and uh take us around and show us your studio okay i'm gonna show you half of the studio <laughs> okay okay <laughs> All right, I'll Whatever you feel comfortable. Okay. okay. There we go. So that's my printing press. And uh, that's a painting I did about the periodic table. Oh. And, when and was that? Why, this was for a show at uh, the Museum of Science and History. Actually, I did this. The first time I showed this was in California at the Pacific Grove Art Center. And then I, I had it in a show in 2012. Uh, Marsh, Marsh contacted me, the Museum of Science and History contacted me, and they wanted to do a show called The Art of Science. And so this was the keynote uh, image in that show. And uh, so it was very high. So cool. Thank you. It's an abstracted version of the periodic table. At the I love it. That, I love how you really are combining their, <laughs> your two passions. Yeah. So Very cool. So that's acrylic and uh, ink. Yes, yeah. uh, no fluid, fluid acrylics, fluid. Uh, yep. modified, modified with medium. Okay. And then I drip, I drip the. I'll let you get a close. I drip the letters on Very top cool. of. Very uh, cool. I love that. Abstracted environment. So yeah. these are some of the paints I use. Yeah. Golden fluid. Yep. Golden fluids. Yeah. And uh, this is my, uh, right here is where I do the, where I keep my cans and my, my different sprays. Oh my God, I love that curve um, little, who made that? Yeah, it was in the studio when I got here, but my friend, one of my other artist friends is my, my art brother. Uh, he, he put the curved panels on there so that they act, they could be shelves, you know? His name yeah. is Overstreet, he's a great artist too. So uh, oh my he God, made I that love for it. me. So, that, so you that use really a helps. lot of spray paints now? Yeah, so a lot of the new work I do, I use spray paints. And uh, what I'm doing now with what I'll show you in a second is with, with the very latest work I was using spray paints. Also, though, I will say before the COVID hit, I was doing, I was doing some oil painting. And I really want to uh, get back to them. But uh, the problem was that I'm an acrylic painter. And oil painting abstractly is hard because, <laughs> before, one, because I have, because I've been painting acrylic, they, um, they you, have. You uh, need the patience. You need the patience yeah, to that's try. What at. Can you I'm go doing... a little closer so we can see them? Because it's, yeah. it's hard for us to, there we go. Yeah. So they, um, they are textured. I was, oh, yeah. Really what I'm, I love what I'm oh. doing with them, but they're, they're textured and I haven't. Uh, it, it takes time to build the layers the way I want. Ooh, I'm using I oil love, sticks. I love that. I love um, the geometric forms that you're creating, and the yeah. palette is beautiful, and the mark making is on point. I, yeah. I really enjoy that. I, I really hope that you go back to that because. Yeah, um, it, yeah, I do too. <laughs> and I will. I mean, you know, really, because of the, the, the last things I'll show you they give giving me the answer that I needed for this work. So I got stuck, right? And also it was because of the, the patience and, you know, it gets slippery and you, so you have to leave it and let it dry. And I wasn't used to that temperament, right? Because yeah. it's not really my temperament. So right. it was a discipline issue too, but also, um, this is another one that, you know, this is kind of where I'm going, but with the new work I'm doing with the acrylics is giving me the answer I need to be able to resolve the rest of these because the other ones are not as not at the, at the level I just showed you and even right. with those even right. with this one I want to pump the color up in, in, a, in, a, yeah. in a few places not all the way but there's a few areas where I want to pop the color and uh you know it, even with oil, like with oil we're using the wax and the oil the drying is it dries differently, right? It dries differently. Yeah, it, so everything. I, yeah, the whole the whole texture, the whole application of the paint, the absorption yeah. of the paint. Is that on panel or on canvas? Uh, these are panels. Uh, okay. Yeah, these these are panels. And actually, this okay. was on canvas, but the rest of it was on panel. So the suite will be. I got this this matrix. I work in series. 
So yeah, I work in series, so I you know it helps me. It helps me. If, you know, I go from one to another, back to right. It, it and informs I bounce around. you. It gives you information. Yeah. 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 So yeah. the the cool thing about it, I I love um, the oil sticks. So I got a drawer <laughs> full of these oil sticks, and they're just <laughs> wonderful. Like they're just heavenly. You know what I mean? The RF well, pigment they, sticks. Well, they what 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 they do is that the pigmentation on them are like a hundred percent. So you get that vibrant color. You don't get. You yeah. know, it's it's so cool to to see that. Yeah, so, so this that's is where your newer, now this is your newer um, series. Yes, this is the new the new work I'm doing with the acrylics and uh, the I think everything I did during COVID, even before, but the, especially that that period in, in COVID, I will I'll give it credit for incubating what's manifesting now, right? And uh, I and because of this series, I think I know what to do with the oils now. I'm going to go, after I get some of these uh, out, uh, I'm going to go back to the oils. Are those uh, with spray the paint or just acrylic? Now, this is this is uh, acrylic spray paint. And so this is what I use. I was using Liquitec. I mean, I was using Liquitec. We do, uh, Princess, we have a, a question. How does she do, um, she do the spray doesn't get hard on the tips and continue flowing? Oh, well, I, actually, like, I use Montana now, and Montana cans and the, the Montana caps, I find, don't clog as much. And when they do clog, I can keep working most of the time with just using an X-Acto knife. You see, X -Acto, and I just scrape the, I just scrape, like, right now, I'm going to put this down and I'll show you that, uh, it's like this, this clog, this cap, let's see, this, this is kind of clogged. Right? right. So right. I take the exacto knife, if I can do it, and I will just scrape away and and, and expose the hole Got of it. the spray. Got and it. then I should be able to spray again. If okay. not, um, you know, I, I, I might have to throw the cap away. But the caps are cheap, so I always keep a supply of caps. But this really keeps me going, working, just using the knife. I can do that. And, I, and Montana actually has a spray now that you can spray through the cap hole to keep it refreshed. So they're, they're, they, they are, they, I, I like them, they dry fast and uh, it's, it's allowing me to move quickly and, uh, and stuff. I started and you with buy, the, with I'm the, assuming that you buy all different kinds of caps, correct? All different sizes. Can you I talk do, about um, that? I do, uh, I do this fat and skinny uh, and wide. I mean, I mean I'm not an expert, uh, um graffiti artist yet and uh but i'm learning and uh, but really i mean to be honest with you at this point i i have experimented with a lot of the caps but i kind of like and i think it's the masochist in me i kind of like the discipline of just using a standard cap and making it work <laughs> you know and figuring then I see out that you how have, to get what i need you have a mask there so it's a little toxic so you have you got to make sure that you have to use the mask right yeah and i don't i mean i'm i'm not i i'm i i don't do everything i'm supposed to do but i i do try to use the mask and i have glasses i have like the chemistry glasses that you put on i don't know what yes. they're over here yeah because you so know, my don't my friend my friend Hilda just said it's like a candy store i swear to god i was thinking the same thing my god yeah, wow. so I use these glasses too to because so, cause, you know you know I was using um, and there's a video of me I, I was using uh, the best the best eye protection I find is swimming goggles. Oh, <laughs> nothing's getting in there, right? But I've seen I've seen pictures of you with the mask and the goggles, and I think it's hilarious. Yeah, I actually, them. I lost them. I gotta get some more, but <laughs> I got these uh, lab lab goggles and they help because you don't think about it but uh especially if you're spraying a lot oh uh, can we go see the, that big painting behind that you didn't show us which one that one the one no 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 you're right to the to your left right there you have a oh. a big can okay. on the bottom too oh holding it one. yeah oh so can we yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 um i i mean all of them look obviously like they're part of a series, but I really enjoy um, every single one of them is a little different. The energy seems the kind of like the same, but the strokes are a little different. And I love the rhythm of all of them. 
they all have like a repetition. So it is kind of like music notes to me because they do have a rhythm and, you know, and I think that that's why they're so successful because your eye kind of goes in and out of the whole painting, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I am really enjoying this. This is the most honest work um, that's, come, that's come out of me a while. And actually, I kind of feel uh, masterful. Like I, everything that I've done before is making it possible for me to do this new work and which I feel so is the right. I, I know I'm on the right track. And because also doing the new work has helped me solve a problem that had been percolating in my head and had got me stuck. Cause I had right before COVID, I really kind of doing COVID and, you know, before I was really getting focused on um, the oil sticks, you know, cause I, you know, I was converting the studio into more of an oil type situation. And then I was working acrylics at home, um, right. but I got stuck with the oils. And then so I started just doing acrylics everywhere. <laughs> so slowly started moving, <laughs> moving my acrylics back. And it's now, you know, most of my acrylics back at, at, at back here at Cork. And um, and 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 the 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 the, the where the place I was working has really become untenable for what I want to do. So I'm back at Cork now. So your little around. ones that you have. Oh yeah, let's go there. Yeah. Yeah. The little so ones, me... are those also um, spray paint? No. Okay. So these, these are spray paint, right? This, these two. This, so this was the first little series I started at the house. Which I love. This, they're five by fives and they're lovely, you know, and they're fun to do. And you had but, stencils in there. It looks yeah, like and it. Yeah, they're stencils. Let me kind of get this to go back over. My gimbal is acting crazy. But yeah, I had the stencils and um, they were they're very fun to do. So uh, I was working on them, but then they're kind of, I don't know if you, I don't know if it's the size or whatever, but I, there's a like six or seven more of these at the, at my, at the house studio. But I got kind of, they became tedious because I was really becoming anal because the thing with these are, they're very layered. Like I use a stencil, but then I used the fluid, like six or seven, maybe 12 layers of fluid acrylic in the it's white. It's very and black. hard to work so small, isn't it? Yeah. And, and they, because they were so small, I think I got, you know, I was just shot. It was stressful to me. <laughs> it was yeah. stressful to yes. resolve. Yeah. And so I was like, yes. you know what? Yeah. Okay. And, and I like, these are the two I'm showing you, but there's like six or seven that I'm not showing you. And because I haven't resolved them and I'm like, oh. I, I, and I got, I just like, I need to stop working. You started on this to get frustrated. <laughs> right. So exactly. then I started working on these, which I had put away for almost a year or two, uh, these pourings. And I had stopped pouring for a while, uh, several years I hadn't poured. But a lot of these all sold out. The pour, my pour work, uh, my acrylic pours, they, most of them are gone because they, they were very popular. But they're very evolved. I had to mix the paint, let it sit. For a long time, get the let the bubbles evaporate, right? And uh, you know, modify, you know, make sure I have the right uh, solution. They're very chemistry oriented, you know. I feel more like a scientist when I'm doing this because I have to mix up my own colors and get them, you know, the, the different mediums used to get the effect I want. But when they are yeah. done and resolved, they have this. Even though they're, they're acrylic, they have this enamel type of they do look they look them. like almost like resin like but they're not. yeah right they're not they're not and, but they have they they remind me of like a cake or something like that like i like i know they're done when they got that cake <laughs> look to them you know <laughs> yummy yeah right yeah so yeah i had stopped working oh my on goodness those. and look at what we're looking at right now yeah and so now i got all of these this is because of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, you push yourself and look at where you went and now where you are. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it was, it's been really great. And now I look at that painting that you created for this project. Yes. So this is my advocate's painting. And it's in the same kind of vein of yeah. the series that this came from. Yeah. But this is a, this is a nice little paint. And it's, it's, it also speaks to one of the, the very first uh, pieces in the Abacus series is for a commission I did in Tampa, 40 by 120 inches. And, uh, oh, wow. uh, and it, it was about the history of, a, of the Abacus. It was, uh, it was for an accounting firm. And we, we, did, we agreed that the Abacus was a good symbol. 
And if you look at like my periodic table painting, I find that uses symbology, uses something that kind of like that, that everyone understands uh, right. would kind of connect people to the relationship between science and math. And I started with uh, paintings where I did, I put algebraic equations in the painting and trigonometry. And, you know, it turned off some people because, uh, I mean, some people say, oh, that's cool. But then a lot of people are math phobic and they don't like this. They don't want to see that. <laughs> so I felt that the periodic table was a more neutral, <laughs> neutral oh my thing. Gosh. And, and it was very, and it's been very popular. And also they, um, and the, the the abacus is uh is is neutral and people so like can it. Can you show us the abacus again? The number one. So yeah, you guys. So um, Princess created this in her um, COVID time, but um, she also is giving this original piece of artwork, and it is for sale, and it will start today. So you can DM me or Princess. It is for sale for $500 and 100% of the proceeds will go to Feeding America. So if you're interested in this beautiful, incredible, powerful painting, please, please make a donation to Feeding America. Let me or Princess know if you're interested and let's make money for Feeding America. Um, my army of artists have made over $16,000 um, and that is the equivalent of more than 65,000 meals, I believe. It's a crazy amount of meals that we have been able to give to people in need. Um, there is a lot of need and there will still be a lot of need. Um, so if you wanna help and you wanna get this beautiful piece of artwork um, in return, uh, please, please, please message me or Princess. Um, and again, the price for this will be $500. So thank you, Princess. I am so excited and I'm so hopeful that we're going to sell that today. Yes, me too. That would be awesome. Awesome. That would be yes. awesome. That would be awesome. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that these are this this painting and uh, it's, it's basically using stencils and um, but also geometric abstraction. So it, it pretty much collimates uh, like the solidifies the, my theories about how to uh, dissect space and so forth to to excite the, the eye and, uh, and, uh, and affect the way the the viewer perceives the environment. Right. So that kind of work kind of led back to what I'm doing now with this piece, these pieces, right? So they start off, like I get that expression coming out, right? And uh, very quickly, but then I, then I, what I'm finding now is that, you know, it, it looks great far away, but there is, is a little messy when you get up close, right? And so it, the essence of it's there. But I want to clarify it now, so for the eye. So now I, what I'm finding is I'm going and cleaning up area Editing. so that you can see mm -hmm. really what it is that I want you to see, right? right? Without the distraction of the messiness. So that's what's taking a lot more time, but it's resolving and it's almost, I feel almost like uh, a, 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 a conductor in the orchestra. Right. So it also speaks back to the music. And I actually created this one listening repeatedly to Miles Davis, um, Bitches Brew album over and over and over again. And I feel that the color choice and all of that it, it, with that sentiment is like a magical thing. Like, so I you know feel like now that witch. you say that I am actually looking like it's a scene at a club where people are dancing and really? having okay. fun and very urban living. Um, lot of buildings around um yeah. you know and so taking that information from abacus where you you know you almost have the uh driver plate you know on it um this becomes now the city like the city scene for me but it's this interesting you said that because the original painting that i did of the abacus series that this was based off of yeah. Um, was was uh, I don't know if, if your if your viewers are aware of uh, the painter poet uh, Piet uh, Moldrian 
and he created a painting. He's like one of the founding fathers of the of the move of the abstract movement. Um, yeah. He was Dutch, and he died in New York or something like that. Uh, he died of exposure. Very sad, sad thing. But he was great abstractionist, and he extracted from landscapes to realism. And he started a series called Boogie Woogie, uh, Boogie Woogie Nights, and it was inspired by. It yeah. was inspired by the looking out the window in New York City and seeing all the lights. And so that he that his work is most his work and Kandinsky's work uh, mostly influenced how I decided to attack the abacus um, problem, right, as a compositional a, a, a issue and also a ge geometric abstraction. So I mean, the circles kind of just could re remind you of the abacus. The primitive yeah. abacus, but yeah. the way that the space is designed is dissected, whether it's a horizontal or a square. Um, the, the that if you ever if you can refer to that painting, Boogie Woogie, uh, uh, Broadway Boogie Woogie for by Mondrian, M O N D R I A N, yeah. uh, you, yes. you'll see yes. the connection. And so that yeah. goes back to that's also still in my brain. So I think that's also coming out with this new work. Yeah, I that mean, I can totally see it. And um, maybe now you can flip the camera so we can um, see you now and, and talk okay. to you. Um, okay. Because we, you probably don't have time to um, show us how you spray paint, do you? Oh. oh you didn't, I didn't sign oh. up for that. <laughs> I didn't. Oh. I, I, I <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, because we still need to talk about um, the mural that um, three two other artists and yourself um, just finished. So can you talk about that mural and where it is and where people can come look at it? Because it's pretty incredible, actually. Yeah, uh, the mural is uh, located downtown Jacksonville in an area, uh, area known as Durkeville. And it's an actually historic African-American community um, uh, in the heart of downtown. Uh, uh, it's on Myrtle Avenue and 18th Street. And uh, it's a it's a very interesting community, and I, I doing the mural made me do a lot of research about uh, historic Durkeville, and uh, I learned that it's one of the first uh, communities that was established for freed uh, African Americans after the Civil War, and uh, and so it was a, and it was a very uh, successful uh, environment for people. Trying to, well, hold on. Sorry, my <laughs> my gimbal is acting nutty. It was a very successful environment. It was an architect, a black architect, so it was building houses for the community and so forth. But it, over time, you know, that was the 1860s and 70s uh, and 1900s. But over time, you now it's fast forward. You know, the city area has become uh, depressed and um, neglected. And uh, you know, somewhat blighted as a, as a lot of uh, areas of, around the country are. And so the people of the community uh, also um, have uh, you know not get the not not to get as much attention as other areas of the city. So we felt, that especially under the leadership of uh, Sirwana Brooks here in Jacksonville, uh, she started a, her and her husband started a gallery called Six Feet Away, which was a COVID uh, initiative because because we couldn't go to galleries, she and her husband decided to put art outside in the yard, in their, in their yard. And uh, wow. they, got, they were on NPR and they got uh, all this press about it. And That's amazing. Uh, it was, was great. And people were coming uh, from all over the city just to drive by and see the art in the yard. And so the whole concept of six feet away, because we had to stay six feet away from each other because of the virus, right? right. So right. it was a great idea. And from that incubated this idea of um, this initiative to uh, the do a mural project in a, in an area that really needed some color, that really needed brightening up, and also inspiration, and and tying that all into voting because that's what uh, that's how we're going to make changes. That's how we we improve our communities all over the place is by 100%. having a voice. Yep. So the the whole initiative was about that, you know. Uh, and that's one. Um, there's three sides to the building. Uh, someone donated um, their outside of their this warehouse space for for the project. And, and uh, Miss Brooks, uh, she coordinated that with the owner, and he he graciously donated his walls for us to do. And and the other facet of the project is that a lot of artists 
unless they have been exposed or had the you know experience they can't get the experience especially when you're dealing with mural work either you have the experience already and that's why you keep getting projects or you don't have the experience and you're not going to get any projects so this was a way also to help artists who who haven't been exposed to or had the opportunities to do a lot of mural work um, to do something that also had a, a connection to the city, uh, to the people of that community, more importantly. So th I think that's one of the reasons, one of the things I think all of the artists that's, that's involved with the project uh, feel uh, that the, you really get a sense that this makes a difference. Like there's art, you can buy an art and put it on a painting and put it in your wall, or it right. could be in a museum. But this, right. the people, this is on the street and people walking past, people going to the store, people going to the gas station, people going to school, they see it. And it's a tech, you know, some people are afraid to go to the museum. Some people are afraid to go to gallery, right? But this was, they can't, uh, they can just look and see it and it's, it's accessible. You know, it's, it's really- That's so great powerful. that you, you know, that you threw yourself out of your comfort zone probably because right. it's massive and- yeah, it yeah, and um, you know, you did something. You collaborated with people, but you're also helping the community at large. I mean, this is a really good feel project all around. Right. I mean, it has yeah. all the great elements. Um, I'm gonna turn on um, the comments. If anyone has questions, this would be the great, the greatest time to ask questions. Um, and. Um, Tell us a little bit about the process of using spray paint because not a lot of people use spray paint. So do you just like switch, switch around and you just feel it and you just start making marks with it? It would be, how, how, is, this, how is the process of that? Well, I think, uh, well, it, it, I think it depends on how you like to work, but it's, you know, especially starting out, I think, you know, knowing knowing what it is you want to do so be free with the paint and so you have to experiment with how it flows and you know sometimes you know and the distance between the you and the substrate right so right. if you're too close you know it'll drip the paint might drip uh it, it, but you might like that and if you're so far if you're far enough away you miss right so you know getting comfortable with the different things and you're using both of them to do what you want to do but you're only going to get to know what to use just uh, by doing Right. So once you experiment and you get that, you know, so you got the dripping and you got the lightly layering with the mist. Then I think I think you can't get really away from masking and experimenting with different types of tape and uh, to, to clean up the areas and stuff. But, you know, um, I'm finding that I, I really like the intuitiveness and the, the accessibility of getting the color concentration that I'm getting from the Montana can specifically. But also Liquitex has a good brand of spray paint and now and let really me ask you something quality. can you can you paint acrylic just regular acrylic paint on top of it yes yeah so well, you can build I, specifically, your layers right specifically with liquitex paint that's one of the reasons why i started with liquitex because they had their color line was consistent with their um line with of their... tube paint right okay so the problem with the the problem, but also the benefit of Liquitex is that they don't dry as quickly as Monta uh, Montana, Montana, and, uh, right? Uh, of can or cans like Montana, because uh, the whole their whole point was to make paint that you can you can actually mix with real paint, right? So it stays wet longer, right? But if you work vertically, vertically, that that could be problematic because it drips, right? But if you're working flat, then it's okay, right? And yeah. so then you can, and you can pour, up, and, and so when you paint on top of it with another water-based paint, like a tube paint or a fluid, it's going to, it's going to melt uh, appropriately. Instead, like sometimes because of the other aerosol, they, they, the, the, when you paint on top of them, they, they might blotch up, right? Because right. of the different chemistry, right? right. But I, but I really haven't found it with the Liquitex. If that's really what you want to do, I would go with Liquitex for sure. Okay. But Montana, and can you add at the end, can you add the oil um, sticks? If you wanted to, yeah, I think well, the rule still applies, fat over lean, right? right? So I and you know you got lick Montana has markers and Liquitex has markers, so I found that the markers probably have some more alcohol in them or something because they're thinner. So if you want to if you want to go from thin to thick to thick, right? You go, I would say the markers, the acrylic markers, very the thinnest you're gonna get, 
then spray paint is a little fatter but not that much but it's a little fatter than the markers and then then the two paints right okay and then if you modify with gels then on top so you know thin to thick is still a rule i would say okay okay because it you I mean to minimize cracking and um degradation yeah so, um i just um someone just said how do you manage time how do you decide how to allocate time to new experiments versus those techniques and ideas that have garnered you um, praise and attention? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I, I think uh, one thing I learned in art school was try to make the most of the situation. And one of the issues I had in art school was that I, you know, I wanted to do my own work, but I, you had assignments. And so you you can you use so you're so busy with assignments and turn them in you don't get to do your own work. So the way I tricked myself was to make the assignment something I part of my own work. So I try to connect the whatever the teacher or professor wanted me to do with something I already wanted to do. And so that and so it so at the at that time that I'm learning something at the same time I'm trying I can use I can accomplish something that I'm trying to work on. Right. So I found that you know a commission for example, it's, it's not my work. It's my work, but it's for someone else. But I try to do work in the commission that is helping me with my own problems. Like this, this painting here, I started for myself, but since someone wanted it, and, and so now I'm resolving it and having to resolve it. I'll be honest with you, I was afraid of it. Like I was, I liked the freshness of the of this new work, right? And but I knew that I wanted some some clarity some resolution and i but i was afraid because i didn't want to lose the freshness by clarifying i didn't want to lose that intuitive freshness so i just i kind of like just didn't know what to do but then someone uh wanted me to to get it ready for a public project and i was like okay so now i have to i have to figure it out like right now like i don't have all the time all the months to wait to figure it out so it forced me <laughs> to to start working on it and and because of that I've resolved all the issues, but I wouldn't have done it unless someone had commissioned me to <laughs> to finish the piece because I would because I would have pussy put it around, you know, and just like oh, so. Where know. where can we find you, Princess? Where can we find your work? Uh, you know, you mean digitally or in person? Just no, just digitally, and then if people have questions as to where they can buy your artwork, okay. Um, um, my website is uh, easy. Uh, my name, uh, www.princessrashid.com. Um, and my most up-to-date uh, archive is, if you go to the top of my Instagram, which my Instagram handle is prashidartist. Which uh, I will put everything down yeah. uh, um, on the interview. So. In uh, in the bio of my of my Instagram, there's a, the link to my archive. Um, and I, I use um, Artwork Archive to, to catalog all my work. And uh, it's it's kept most up to date. I've been delinquent of keeping my website up to date. So <laughs> the archive is more up to date, but I'm going to get to it. But right now I'm a one woman show. So uh, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so. <laughs> and uh, and last uh, but not least, you are we only have like two minutes. So and then we're going to get cut off. But you are going to a residency to um, do some printing, major printing, woodblock printing um, with a master printing uh, printer who is going to do your um, paintings into prints. How excited are you about that? I'm super excited. I've been coveting like this been out to years. I've been wanting to be invited to, and I haven't been invited yet. So this is my first invitation to work with a master printer. And I'm a printmaker, but uh, I'm not quite a master printmaker in the sense I'm more of a painter. And uh, for the, a master printmaker works to res to help the painter or the sculptor res uh, translate their vision into the print medium. And even though I'm a printmaker, uh, you know this is a different experience this is someone there for me to as a conduit and uh, yeah. i'm so excited to to i mean i'm a little i'm a little nervous but i'm very excited <laughs> about doing it and, and, and this new work i think will be is perfect for this experiment so we'll see how it goes oh i can't wait to <laughs> so. see please take lots of pictures and send them my way and again um if anyone is interested in purchasing abacus number one 
uh, please DM me or Princess and let's do this together. I, we can't do it without you, um, without your help. Um, so let's help Feeding America. And Princess, thank you so, so much for opening your studio doors to, to all of us today. You gave us so much food for our thoughts and, and, uh, and you have a beautiful soul. So thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, please, yes, uh, consider purchasing some work. It's for a very good cause. Sounds good. Take care. Take care. We'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye.